success breeds success and failure breeds failure and it's not necessarily linear and that's a really difficult thing to deal with and it's hard on societies because one of the things we do know is that you know, as you stretch out the inequality you make men, particularly, on the lower end of the distribution more and more likely to be aggressive it's sort of like, you imagine every man has a threshold for violence um, and status is important to men not that it's not important to women, but it's different it's, it's a different kind of status it's, status is important to men because it's one of the things that makes them marketable as partners to women so it actually turns out to be quite important to men the men tend to compete with one another for status hierarchy position and in a really unequal society if you're like a low rung guy then, and you don't have any opportunity to rise because the society isn't structured so that there's mobility then the more aggressive guys tend to turn to criminality and you know, and so you could say there's a threshold for criminality and the more inequality pressure you put on a particular area, geographic or political area the more inequality pressure you put on it the more men slip past that threshold and into criminality you know, it's not like money is necessarily a, a good for everyone, it's hard to manage money it's really easy for it to disappear, I mean elderly people have a hell of a time now because you know, crooks are contacting them on the internet non-stop and so, just giving people money money is like, it's like pouring water in their hands it's not that helpful, not necessarily that helpful and then, of course, contributors to poverty are well, it's not so good to have a low IQ you know, people don't like the idea of IQ because it seems so arbitrary, you know, you have a high IQ, well, it's not like you deserve it exactly it's, you're set up that way pretty much right from the beginning, it's very, 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 very stable you can make a high IQ person stupider by, you know, not educating them up to the level of their possibility but taking someone who has a low IQ and trying to raise that, it's like, if you can figure out how to do that well, you know, it's Nobel Prize time for you, because people have tried that a lot and most recently with those, you know, lumino lumosity games and that sort of thing and the evidence that those produce anything other than brilliant performances on the lumosity game itself is basically zero my dad used to take the dog for a walk and then the cat got lonesome and so it started to follow him and first of all it would just go along the buildings, the houses on their route you know, hiding really from predators and after a while I got kind of comfortable with that, and then it would follow right behind the dog but, it had a border, and if my dad took the dog over one street too many for the cat the cat would just sit on the corner and, and you know, cry like a cat cries it was like, that's it for me man, I'm not going any farther out into the unknown and so, the, the distinction between the territory that you have mastered and the territory that you haven't mastered is a fundamental distinction it's the distinction between home and, and, and the strange land and the thing about familiar territory for people is that most of the familiar territory that we inhabit is other people because we're so social so you can't really think, it's a weird way of thinking about territory it's not exactly geographical, objective territory it's territory with a dominance hierarchy in it and the dominance hierarchy has a predictable structure and you know where you fit in it most of the time and so that when you act out in that territory surrounded by your people then often you get what you want and you're so thrilled about that because you just don't want someone acting erratically around you like, and you know that, so you walk down Bloor and there's people there that should really be institutionalized but we deinstitutionalized them all so they could be free and free to be, you know suffering and malfunctioning out on the street, that's what the freedom ended up being but you know, you'll f walk by someone like that who's muttering away to the voices in his head and you know, maybe striking out against whatever it is that's plaguing him and you'll make eye contact you might even go across the street, you're certainly going to give him a wide berth you're going to keep a distance between 
him and you and you're going to hope that you don't attract his attention because he's not in the dominance hierarchy and you don't know what the hell he might do and that's unexplored territory too that's another way of thinking about it, like we inhabit time and space, not just space and not just time, we inhabit time and space and our territories are spatial temporal we're here now and this is safe now and it's safe partly because of the physical structure and it's working but it's also safe because none of you are manifesting peculiar behavior but if you started to manifest peculiar behavior if you stood up and started muttering or yelling or maybe attacking someone next to you all the rest of you would freeze first because then all of a sudden this would be unexplored territory the match between what you want, which is a peaceful lecture that you hope has some content the match between what you want and what's happening has vanished and so then you're not, you don't know where you are and so then what do you do when you don't know where you are? what do you do when you don't know what to do? well if you're a computer you just crash but you know, what good is that to you? you're just gonna die? that isn't helpful you freeze first and then maybe you cautiously, cautiously attend or maybe you don't, maybe you just keep your damn eyes averted and you sit there and you hope that no one notices you that's a, pred that's a prey response, right? that's like a rabbit frozen when it thinks a fox is looking at it and we were prey animals for a long time there was a cat that they recently discovered, a prehistoric cat that had this bottom single tooth and they found out that it, a human skull fit right inside its mouth and so it could grab you here and pierce the back of your skull with its, with its single tooth and that's what it was evolved for so, you know it's under such conditions we evolved and we're predators obviously but we're tasty predators and so other things were perfectly happy to eat us and so when you're where you don't know what to do, you act like a prey animal and that's probably what you should do because maybe if you keep your head down and shut the hell up there won't be any attention attracted to you and maybe you'll get through it you know, you, you might decide, unlikely, to intervene and take the guy down but, but you would be the exception rather than the norm and it's unsurprising Okay, so, what I came to understand was that belief systems regulated emotions but not exactly psychologically, like it isn't exactly it isn't exactly, and this is sort of like the terror management theories it's not exactly like you have a theory in your head and the theory explains the world and because the theory explains the world the theory is what's making you secure it's kind of like that it's like you have a theory in your head and the theory makes you feel secure because it explains the world but the reason it explains the world is because other people have the same theory in their head and then when you both act out the theory you both get what you want and it's the, it's the coming together of the theory and the outcome that makes you it's life it not only does it stop you from being anxious and, and often make you happy because you get what you want but it's not just psychological, you know, the fact that we do this, that we cooperate within our societies we match our belief systems and then act them out that's the predicate for a productive society so, it's actually, it isn't that just that it sa saves you from death anxiety like the terror management theorists have it it's, it saves you from death and that's good, I mean, being protected from death anxiety yeah, oh good, that's great too, man but actually not dying, that's sort of the fundamental thing that you're after and so, people have reason to defend their territory if you think of territory that way, as, as you think about it as a domain where the fundamental presuppositions of each citizen are matched by the behavior of their co-citizens they have every reason to defend that and if it falls apart, it can have mortally serious consequences, it's chaos, you know, and that chaos doesn't just destabilize everybody psychologically it destabilizes everything, it can destabilize the currency, it can destabilize the industrial economy, it can, the lights can go off, it's like 
It's not good. So, hey, no wonder people protect it. So then I started thinking about what a belief system was. And I realized that a belief system was actually a set of moral guidelines. And moral guidelines are guidelines about how you should behave. Also how you should perceive. And the reason that a moral guideline is necessary for you to perceive is that you can't look at anything without a hierarchy of value. Right? Think about it. Like how many things in this room could you look at? There's an in innumerable things in this room to look at. There's just all these squares, the little tiny squares in this fabric. You could look at those things for till the end of time, one at a time, but you don't do that. In fact, if I took most of you out of this room, there's a very low probability that you'll be, you'd be able to tell me what color the walls were, or even if those things were on the walls. And the reason for that is that, who cares? As long as the walls don't move, color is irrelevant, and there's no reason for you to remember it. It has no emotional significance. It has no value. And so what you do instead is, well, this is what you're doing. So, why are you here? I don't mean in the broad metaphysical sense, I mean specifically, why are you here right now? And I would say, well, you're students, obviously, and you're trying to get a degree, and you know, you believe that that will have some functional utility, maybe you'll be a little wiser, and a little more literate, and a little and be able to think a little better, and be able to write a little better, and so you'll actually be more functional in the world that would be good you know, and, and maybe you're interested, and, but anyways, it's you're in this particular lecture, so that you can take this particular class so that you can get a particular kind of degree, so that you can launch your life and then in your life you're probably going to meet someone that you have a long-term relationship with, and you're going to have children, and you're going to partake in this society and that's why you're here. All of those reasons, simultaneously, is why you're here. And so then, that helps you decide what to look at. And so, what you look at is, at the moment, or listen to, is me, because, in principle, I'm the gateway to that set of accomplishments, at this moment. And so, you focus on me. And that's because you value that. And so what that means is you can't even look at the world without a value structure. You know, it's chaos if everything is equally unimportant or if everything is equally important. You know, I worked for a UN committee at one point and they, the UN committee had like a hundred proposals for how the world could be improved, but there was no order to them. It's like it wasn't, you know, this was more important than this. It's like, well, that's the end of that, you know, you got to start with something, and so that means you have to make something more important than other things, obviously in your life if everything's of equal importance, then you, you're paralyzed now, you know, it's a truism, and probably an oversimplified one, that since the dawn of the scientific revolution a wedge has been driven through the heart of our society, such that the moral systems that we use to unite us so those would be religious systems, fundamentally have been subject to an intense critique from the scientists and, you know, it's a pretty effective critique uh, even if you have, even if you've maintained a traditional faith, it's like, you know the scientific onslaught is no joke and that's a problem, as far as I can tell, because and the problem is, is that you're still left with the problem of how you should act the more disruption, the more destabilized you're going to be which is why if, if someone tells you that you're going to perish painfully in three months, it's like that's a bad one you're really in an unexpected territory, there are nothing that you assumed that was real, roughly speaking, in the world, is real anymore we like to watch people, in their normal life, blindsided by something 
experiencing this interregnum of chaos where they explore and gather new information and retool their character or retool the world because you could, either of those would work as a solution and then come out the other side and things are better than they were to begin with or at least as good, but better is better, that's a happy ending, right? that's a happy ending, that's a comedy technically speaking and so what you want, you want your life to be a comedy not that it's supposed to be funny because comedy doesn't have to be funny technically speaking it's just the opposite of tragedy tragedy is when you're going along pretty well and you get blindsided and that's that and you know that can certainly happen, it happens to people all the time but it's a comedy you want 